Hey, well, here we are. Festival, second week. And this is my favorite event of the festival. It's incubator night. And this is a chance to hear from the researchers that have uh, taken some research funds from the Halloran Trust and done really exciting things. So we're gonna hear from our two current incubators tonight. Uh, the, the first one is focusing on infrastructure and I'll introduce the uh, researchers shortly. And um, the second one is, is focusing on a very important issue of um, Aboriginal um, housing. And we'll hear from them starting at about 5.30 from here from that research team. So look, before I begin, can I just acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet? And in my case, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, you might like to um, put in the chat the Aboriginal land that uh, you're listening to this session from. But it's on, upon these ancestral lands that University of Sydney is built and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So look, let me introduce the um, two researchers that are gonna to talk to us about their infrastructure incubator tonight. And first one on, on my immediate uh, left here is um, my colleague, Associate Professor Turan Elizada, who's based here at the Sydney School of Architecture, Design and Planning. Um, she's the lead uh, investigator on this project, which we're calling the Infrastructure Governance Incubator. And Turan's going to tell you about uh, the project shortly. And Turan's um, for a long time has had a research at the intersection of the urbanism, particularly telecommunications planning. You might have uh, seen her or heard her in the um, NBN space where she's been a very active commentator for many years. Now, joining uh, Turan on um, Zoom this, this evening is Dr. Crystal Legacy, who's also working on the incubator. Crystal's a senior lecturer in urban planning at Melbourne University. Crystal's published widely on the topics of urban transport, strategic planning and urban policy, um, and particularly around the issues of uh, politics of citizen participation in infrastructure planning, which um, she's been a really a, 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 a national leader in. So look, um, without any further ado, um, we're going to hear from um, Turan and, and um, Crystal for about 15 minutes, and then there's a real chance for you to ask them some questions. This is the start of Turan's incubator. She's very much interested, I think, in, in feedback and engagement from you, the festival audience. Uh, so please feel free to um, put your questions in the chat and we'll get a chance to listen and discuss those with uh, Turan at the end of the talk. So Turan, over to you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to share our um, incubator with the audience tonight. It would be great if I could have the slides on. Thank you. As Peter uh, was men, uh, mentioned, tonight I will be talking about the recent, the most recent incubator project funded by the Halloran Trust. And uh, my goal for tonight is to actually articulating and describing what I believe that is a very timely research agenda, focusing on infrastructure governance at times of crisis. Uh, as Peter was um, mentioned, I also feel like it is important to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land that we are uh, gathering on tonight. Uh, uh, in my case, you know, I live, work, and pretty much I, you know, I have my life on the Gadigal land of Eora Nation. Uh, so my respect to, the, to their elders, past, present, and emerging. It's my great honor, and I feel like it's an opportunity to once again thank you, uh, thank uh, uh, the trust for uh, putting their trust uh, you know, in us uh, with this amazing project. It's been a bumpy and long road, if you like, for us to get to this position, but I feel like everything that we went through uh, got us to this position of having the most timely opportunity to talk about infrastructure and infrastructure governance. Infrastructure is always a very important topic, but when you think about the post-COVID um, time, when you think about the pandemic hit recovery and the very special role that infrastructure needs to play uh, as a stimulus, it couldn't be a better time. 
Uh, in saying so, I'm very um, happy to be part of a multidisciplinary collaborative team. Yes, I'm leading the project, but uh, it is something that wouldn't be possible without the support of my colleagues based at the University of Sydney, Monash, and also Melbourne University. I'm going to introduce them in a sec, but before that, I have to say that we have just started reaching out for industry partners. And we are very happy to, rep uh, to re report that Planning Institute of Australia, both New South Wales and Victoria branches, have already agreed to come on board as our official partners. We are very happy to uh, have them on board and look forward to three years of constructive and fruitful collaboration. So with my colleagues, as I said, uh, we have uh, some of the most outspoken and well-known uh, people on the subject. Glenn Searle, uh, you know, Glenn uh, is uh, known to so many people who knew him via his work at um, uh, here at um, uh, UTS, then uh, University of Queensland, and now at the University of Sydney. Uh, Lytton uh, used to be at QUT, now at, Mo at Monash. Uh, Crystal Legacy, and finally, Rebecca Clemens, who is our uh, postdoc. We are very happy to have uh, Rebecca on board and uh, look forward to work uh, very productively together. Okay, so if we want to go back to the core of what motivated us to put this incubator together, uh, there is no, you know, uh, sugar coating around this. There's been three decades of, at least three decades of, you know, neoliberal orthodoxy which has resulted in a you know in an approach to infrastructure as commodity which is very much detached from the places quality detached from the people that it's supposed to serve you know detached from its adjunct land uses uh, and as a result there is a gulf gulf between uh, strategic plans and uh, the uh, infrastructure projects and especially their de deliveries and uh, the way that we understand again this incubator, uh, the most important challenge is that when you have that sort of approach to infrastructure, it is very unclear who infrastructure is supposed to serve or to what end. You know, when I say what end, I'm talking about other global challenges that uh, never go on hold. You know, things like climate change, things like, you know, the um, increasing level of inequity and inequalities in our cities and regions. Uh, and what happens at time of crisis? You know, when something like COVID happens, it only exacerbates all of these, uh, you know, pre-existing challenges. And uh, yet, there's been a lot of talk, you know, uh, in the media about um, the fact that policymakers should use this as an opportunity to, you know, um, build, um, um, you know, and future-proof basically uh, uh, us by making the right infrastructure investment. But the reality is that the right infrastructure investment is required as certain types of infrastructure have uh, stronger benefits uh, you know in assisting us in recovery and you know uh, bulletproofing our future and if you want to know you know what kind of right infrastructure i'm talking about for us there are you know a set of criteria to what end you know will we use this as an opportunity to uh, have climate change ready future uh, and the sort of infrastructure that help us to decrease the level of inequity and inequality, you know, basically something that helps everyone. And who's going to be funding it? Because if we are going to rely on private sector, you know, doing the heavy lifting for funding, then we're going to end up with a lot of user pay kind of infrastructure that is not for all. And yeah, I acknowledge that there is a time, a scale, you know, challenge here. You want short term, you know, basically benefit to the uh, um, um, uh, economy in terms of employment. And then there are questions around, you know, large scale interventions and whether they can make that sort of um, uh, basically um, uh, outcome. Uh, on that subject, I feel like I need to talk about the budget. You know, the federal budget was released only a few weeks ago. The state budgets are, you know, being released. Victoria is releasing their budget tomorrow. And if anything, I don't know about you, but from my perspective, especially when it comes to infrastructure, the federal budget was really underwhelming. And uh, there is a reason that everyone is describing it as a business budget and not as an infrastructure budget. From our perspective, you know, beyond the quantity of infrastructure funding. There is a lot of questions about the quality of infrastructure and what was not there. You know, 
the absence of any basically attention to social housing, the absence of any kind of green infrastructure that can prepare us for you know, climate change. Uh, these are the sort of issues that we cannot get over it. Yes, there was some sort of upgrade and maintenance mentality in the budget, which we welcome because you know they're very much overdue. But uh, let's be honest, many of those construction jobs are also for men. So there is a gender issue to this kind of infrastructure approach. And last but not least, we found it very difficult to find any clear links between what was included in the infrastructure section of budget and what infrastructure Australia has been advocating for years. We found it very difficult to see clear links between the priorities set by Infrastructure Australia. And let's be honest, that is their job, to show the priorities and what was included in budget. On that note, I'll leave it to my um, colleague, uh, Crystal Legacy, to continue the presentation. Crystal, you're on. Thanks, Torin. Okay, well, look, we can learn a lot from the past now, can't we? Um, learning from the past, here we are in a moment of recession. We use the word extraordinary, we throw it around uh, without necessarily considering that the last time we had an infrastructure-led recovery was only about 10 years ago under the global financial crisis. Myself and many others wrote about that time. Um, I wrote a paper called Infrastructure Planning in a State of Panic, and that's the concern at the moment, is that we are panicking and, and using discourse around creating jobs and returning to economic prosperity without really thinking through strategically what are we planning for and for whom, as Turin described. So there's a real opportunity here to situate infrastructure governance planning and strategic planning within a broader social, environmental, and economic and cultural context upon which we tend to leave as neutral when we do infrastructure planning. So there's a real lesson there for us um, to our next slide, please. Um, this is a timely research agenda. Of course it is. Here we are situated um, at a time where national governments, including our state budgets, we're going to have the Victorian state budget delivered tomorrow, um, and it's going to be um, and it's going to be um, uh, very, very large, very, very ambitious. Um, and and one of the things that we draw to uh, draw to uh, account and is at the uh, center of our concern in this research agenda is what is the infrastructure governance model, a model that is both top down but certainly bottom up and that is situated within a broader value system. What is it we're trying to uh, do um, and how are we trying to shape our cities? We know based on the great work of Jago Dodson that infrastructure does lead the structure of our cities and we want to contest that by thinking about infrastructure in new and different ways over the course of this project. Next slide please. So what do we want to do? So we want to develop, so our aim is to develop an infrastructure governance model or models that minimizes the incongruity between infrastructure strategic planning and the delivery of that planning or that infrastructure for Australian cities. It's obviously well-timed. We are at, at this moment where infrastructure is at the center of much of the conversations in terms of planning policy. But our focus is not just infrastructure planning and its governance, but also the financing of infrastructure, which of course is drawn from multiple scales um, beyond, well and truly beyond Australia, uh, but yet has very local impact. So very complex scale or dimensions that we need to uh, take into account. We're also interested in this terminology, this term called social licensing. This idea that the work that we do, uh, the work that governments do and their proponents needs to be situated within a context that uh, is politically, socially, uh, and culturally acceptable. It, it is situated within a broader discourse and conversation about the future of our cities. Social licensing allows us to think about how that is acquired over the course of uh, a planning process that extends from early, uh, early visioning of, of strategic uh, thinking all the way down to project planning and its uh, very important local impacts. We're going to be uh, um, answering this question and guided by this aim through a series of mixed methods, uh, a systemic uh, literature review that uh, uh, the fantastic Rebecca Clemens is currently working on uh, in collaboration with us. Uh, key informant interviews with policymakers uh, from all scales of government, uh, community groups, um, planners, and, and political, and the political elite, of course. 
this is case study based research uh, that we're going to be uh, that's going to drive this research agenda uh, situated both in New South Wales and also in Victoria and we're uh, hopefully um, going to uh, also undertake a citizens uh, survey. Next slide please. Okay, so case study selections. This is the really exciting part of the project. Now, this is an ongoing discussion. We really look forward to hearing from you and any input and ideas that you might have, but we see this as a multi-sectoral case study. We want to make sure that we don't uh, buy into the silo mentality and see uh, the infrastructure as only transport or as only housing or as only place making. We want to see it across the full remit of what might constitute planning. So it's going to be comprehensive in its reach. And we're also interested in this idea of bundled infrastructure. We're not just looking at one or two things coming together. We want to think about it at a scalar um, and at a sectoral, but also at a precinct level. We're interested in place making it in the creating of, of, of communities as well. Um, next slide, please. So here are just some um, um, visual representations of what bundled infrastructure might 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 generate in terms of an imaginary. Um, I'm just thinking about this photo here of Melbourne, the blue lines. Those are cycling routes, um, the inner city and the inner north here in Melbourne. Bundling that together, that very quickly becomes a very exciting mega infrastructure project, which is not another new big toll road, uh, which is something we like to build a lot of here in Melbourne. Um, Next slide, please. So here are our research questions. So uh, I won't read them out to you because I am very aware of time. But the first one here is to what extent does strategic planning and infrastructure planning align with the actual delivery of infrastructure? And the second one is how can strategic planning for infrastructure be better aligned? So to what extent and then how can we do it better? Um, and breaking that down through a series of sub questions to help guide our inquiry. Uh, next slide, please. So next steps, well, the next steps is to well, conduct the research. Here we go. Um, um, very much to participate in a series of policy discussions, a series of discussions, um, very importantly, embedded in communities. That's something that I, I, I know myself, um, I'm very committed to, uh, as well as a, a conversation with, with all of you about where we can take this research in this very early uh, part of our, our journey together. Um, and I believe that's it for me. I think the next slide is the big question mark. Do you have any questions for us? Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Taran and Crystal. That's very interesting. And yeah, just um, remind um, uh, your viewers out there that this is the start of, of the project. It's been running for um, a couple of months now. The, uh, the um, research fellows in place and um, has started work, but you know, there's a real chance to um, uh, influence perhaps uh, their directions, but also make some suggestions about such an important issue. And I think one of the interesting things um, we're going to hear from our, uh, our incubator that's at the end of their process um, shortly. And uh, they were looking at the question of housing for health and infrastructure really turned up as an important issue um, for them, which uh, will be um, part of their, their talk we'll hear shortly. But if we can just have a look at the chat, Andrew, and just see um, what we got in, um, in terms of some questions. Okay, uh, there's um, um, people are telling us where they're from, um, which is exciting. But um, just wanted to talk uh, a little bit about some questions that I um, actually got earlier in the day that um, came in when people were invited to, um, to register. Um, and Taran, this, this first question I, I, I found um, quite interesting. People, people wanted to know, um, there were two different questions, but they were sort of around the same issues. They wanted to know whether you were going to actually introduce um, an issue about uh, the Aboriginal voice in infrastructure planning and delivery, because a lot of people are concerned and particularly, I think this question must have come from Melbourne with uh, that uh, road project and um, the, the issue around uh, those very old trees. Um, but whether, whether your project's gonna cover the issue of um, uh, the Aboriginal voice in infrastructure planning um, and secondly, um, there was a, 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 another reader, I think it was from Sydney, who was complaining about the number of examples recently where governments have paid too much um, uh, for, for land for infrastructure projects and whether your project is going to look at anything in terms of um, improving um, methods for land acquisition in um, infrastructure. Um, I guess there are two questions here. Uh, you know, the one about the Aboriginal voice to infrastructure um, planning. 
uh, and infrastructure decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, the tree tragedy in Melbourne was really shameful. I don't think that there is anyone um, anywhere in Australia, you know, in the government system that would defend it. Some may tell you that, you know, by their practical mind or practical standards, you know, by the time that they've realized how big of a deal that tree was, it was too late to do anything about it. I mean, that's the only defense that you can really expect to hear. And that goes back to not just having an Aboriginal voice to infrastructure planning. I also think that it's about Aboriginal voice to a strategic planning, which should come before our, you know, even infrastructure decisions. Uh, we have had conversations among ourselves uh, around those, you know, main questions, you know, to whom, to what end. And as part of our emphasis and dedication to both actually climate justice and social justice, I actually think that any planning decisions on unceded land needs to be accounting for a strong Aboriginal voice. There is no other way to get planning right on unceded land. Uh, about your second question about land accusation, I, did there, there are a lot of questions around finance, you know, fi financialization of uh, infrastructure. And one of the things that we have realized even in these earlier steps are about uh, lack of data. So in many cases, business cases are not really public. In many cases, you hear about some of these issues a few years later as part of a, you know, corruption inquiry case because they are not really shared with public. And I have to say that the, finan uh, the financial planning part of infrastructure and its you know, alignment or misalignment with the actual delivery and actual cost is definitely one of the three areas that we will be looking at in this project. But at this, at least at this early stage, we are not confident how much we can address it versus how much we find ourselves in a pos position of just pointing out how muddy the water is. Because if the, if the data is not available, if the business cases are not public, it's very difficult to scrutinize anything. Sure, no, that's a good point. Now, um, I've got a question here from Heather Nesbitt, which I might direct towards Crystal, if you don't mind, Crystal. And um, Heather's asking, um, give a recent events and strong public support, you know, which um, Heather's taking as a social license. Will the project look at social infrastructure, such as aged care, mental health, and community resilience infrastructure? That's a really great question, Heather. Thank you. It's been very much a part of our discussions around the parameters of and the scope of the project, and hence why we've kind of landed on this idea of bundled infrastructure. We really want to look at uh, multiple forms of infrastructure. We want care infrastructure, social infrastructure, uh, as, as integral to, to thinking about uh, the delivery. Um, in part, we want to move away from just this silent idea of mega transport or mega infrastructure. I mean, we're rarely interested in some of the discourse being uh, led out of the Grant Institute on that very question. We really want to challenge some of that, um, that a series of small projects can become bundled together to form mega infrastructure, which is something that our politicians tend to really like. They like the ribbon cutting thing. Um, the other thing I just wanted to note, though, thinking a little bit about um, Victoria uh, around the significance of the research that we're doing is that it's not just a gap between strategic planning and project planning that that's the problem here. The problem is also the way in which community engagement is conducted, which is absolutely in the context of which I do my planning here in Victoria is broken. Um, so there's a real opportunity to truly rethink and through an, an Indigenous lens is, is a really strong and powerful and important starting point for us to start rebuilding that relationship between the community engagement um, and, and, and infrastructure planning in its fullest understanding. I, I think that's a pretty important point, Crystal. And um, you know, certainly um, some people who participated in the festival in previous years um, were very concerned, say, for something like West Connects that had 4,400 submissions, um, most of which um, were quite critical of the project and 
I think the community was pretty concerned that they didn't think they had a voice in, in, in what happened. Um, we just got a, a, a time for a couple more questions. We've got a, a question here from um, that we've, we've discussed a little bit last week in the uh, festival. Do you think governments have enough evidence to inform infrastructure decisions given the pandemic and uncertainty about how people will use cities in the future? So um, will we commuting less, will CBDs less, it would be less important, you'll be looking at more local and regional infrastructure. Do you think um, that, that's an issue for your project going forward, Tarun? Um, to be honest, I've said this quite a few times uh, in the last few weeks. In Australia, we are in a very unique and lucky position. We are talking about um, post-pandemic time, and we are talking about recovery around the time that there are 600,000 new daily COVID cases reported around the world. So it sounds like uh, the rest of the world will be struggling with the pandemic uh, for months to come. I feel like that puts this unique position, puts also extra pressure on us in Australia to get it right because the trend that we are starting will be followed and has to be, I mean, there is no other way, by the rest of the world when they find themselves in a position that the case numbers are under control and everything. And in a sense, what is happening right now in our cities is an indication of what may follow in other parts of the world. I feel like a lot of pre-COVID behaviors are already back you know, in terms of the uh, public transport usage rate, in terms of, you know, even going back to office, uh, you know, uh, but with additional layer of flexibility, if you like. Uh, while we no longer have to avoid our offices spaces, but we have learned throughout the COVID that you don't have to be there every day, you know, nine to five to get work done. Uh, you know, we have learned a lot through our, you know, uh, experience even with teaching. As much as we miss students and everything, but we've realized that there are other ways of, um, uh, you know, uh, spreading the love and, you know, spreading the knowledge and all of that. I like to think that that flexibility will be something that we take forward with us. Uh, it may, for example, I mean, if we want to go back to our project, it, it may open conversations on having more inclusive, flexible modes of community engagement around the infrastructure. Yeah. I mean, we all have heard for years that, um, you know, community hall, you know, meetings don't work because they're only a certain, you know, social, you know, uh, group that show up, you know, because of their timing and all of that. But you, we have learned through COVID that you can actually have uh, you know, large number of audience uh, by alternative, you know, uh, mode of communication after hours when no one, you know, has to miss because of work. So I like to think that some of this flexibility will get carried on. But if you're asking about the end of city, the end of public space, the end of, oh, no, I, I don't, I don't think that this is the end of geography of any, any way. If anything, people actually miss social interaction people miss public spaces okay. and want to get back. Okay, that's an interesting view. And for people that want to uh, progress that debate further, Wednesday evening, we're uh, trying to synthesize some of those views we've heard from previous weeks about what our cities will look like in the future. Um, I also give a shout out in terms of infrastructure um, tomorrow at lunchtime. Um, we've got Melody Ding talking about um, bicycles as a, as a form of infrastructure that might um, generate some health benefits and also um, reduce some congestion in our cities. But look, can, can we just all put our virtual hands together and thank Taran and Crystal? Um, very interesting outline of your new incubator. We're very excited at the trust about how things are going to roll. And we should catch the um, festival urbanism next year and find out how your first year's gone. But uh, thanks again, Crystal and Taran. And can I invite, um, can I just now invite uh, Pro Associate Professor Tess Lee to join us in the festival urbanism studio? Um, where are we going to hear from her, um, her incubator? Tess, just walk straight in here. We love to um, love to see you. Okay, so um, let me just um, quickly introduce uh, Tess and her colleague, Dr. Liam Greeley, and then um, we'll uh, get stuck right into their, their presentation. And I'll remind people that this is the end of um, uh, Tess's incubator. Well, it's got about four or five months left to run. 
So we um, might be interesting for Turan and Crystal to listen, listen to um, a little bit about the, the process and the experience perhaps of um, that incubator. But um, uh, Tess Lee is an anthropologist. She studies bureaucratic formations and she ponders why social policy is so hard to get right. Um, and she's the author of a really excellent book called Wild Policy that I could recommend. But her research explores different manifestations of policy dysfunction under continuing settle occupation, where it occurs, to whom blame is described, and how to intercept it. And very much her incubator has been around that inter interception role. She leads the Housing Field Health Incubator in partnership with a not-for-profit organisation, Health Habitat. Now, also joining us, um, I think um, you're, you're in uh, Darwin at the moment, um, Liam, um, probably doing more field work, never, never um, let a good researcher uh, do some field work in sunny Darwin. Um, Liam's a postdoctoral research fellow in the Housing for Health Incubator. Um, he's in the Department of Gender and Cultural Studies here at Sydney University. And his incubator research is focused on housing and infrastructure policy, hence the connection with Turan's work in regional and remote Australia, and also, interestingly enough, southeast Louisiana. So the way we're going to roll is a little bit like the previous session. Uh, Tess and um, Liam have a, a short presentation. Um, really interesting, interested to hear what they've got to say in that presentation. Then we'll have a chance for um, questions at the end, and feel free to bang those away in chat and we'll see where we get to. So if you wouldn't mind just sharing Tessa's presentation, Andrew, we'll get into it. Uh, I think that's um, the previous one. Here we go, excellent. Deep Impact Takes Dry Work, Festival of Urbanism 7. Great, thank you, Peter. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me okay, Peter and Tess? Hmm. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Okay, so Tess and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country from which we speak today, the Larrakia people in Darwin and the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation in Sydney, as well as the First Nations people on whose country our field work has taken place. We pay respect to leaders past, present and emerging for their effort to respond to ongoing occupation on land where sovereignty was never ceded. We'd also like to note that, as Peter said, this is our final opportunity to present the work of the Housing for Health Incubator and that this is a talk written in part to describe the importance of the Henry Halloran Trust's investments. So in the push by universities to prioritise impact, a key truth is often submerged. Deep impact takes sustained, dry, and often invisible work. Discussion of impact's twin, engagement, similarly understates the undramatic and time-consuming work required to affect change. It also neglects the importance of the seemingly pointless. Pointlessness, as in not done for research points, is key to authentic impact. The C words that now populate university discourse, collaboration, co-development, co-design, community consultation, and so on, are politically irrefutable. Take the term co-design. According to Emma Blomkamp, while this concept offers some innovations when in-depth partnerships are involved, in its more loosely defined application, to quote, any type of collaborative or participatory activity, almost everyone seems to be doing it, end quote. But even the most well-intentioned co-design processes can potentially be little more than playful inclusion exercises. Developing analyses that are radically contextualised and creating pathways for research to impact messy and unequal worlds requires trust and engagement. These take time to build through forms unrecognised by official impact registers. This is the importance of the incubator program. Since 2018, the Housing for Health incubator has been pursuing work across three key questions. One, why is the consistent supply of routine repair and maintenance in Indigenous housing so hard to secure? Two, what can we do to assist the practical questions of our key partner, Health Habitat, in their ongoing work with Indigenous communities and organisations? And three, how can we understand infrastructural inequalities and policy cultures writ large? We've achieved multiple impacts, which people can explore on our website. 
And where possible, we've drawn attention to these through the usual means, at research events, in public media, curating exhibitions, proclaiming new funding, and highlighting our publications. But equally significant impacts have often been off stage and out of sight. Answering our questions has demonstrated that the most useful labouring that researchers might do is often the least exciting or public. This is labour that crawls through data that can be hard to decipher, uncovering legislative detail that protects government departments from service obligations, slap maps that identify where infrastructure and amenity is and isn't planned, and service records that convey how corroding health hardware is or isn't responded to. These are just some of the items that must be tracked down to understand how infrastructural pasts determine present and future possibilities. These interrogations rarely provide the pleasures of ground up research reproduced subsequently as partnership tales from the field. Even so, we argue that such efforts are a key means by which academics can use their skill sets and professional status to help unwind forms of settler administrative damage and a key benefit of the incubator program. In some of the critical commentary on government delivery of housing in remote Indigenous communities, it's commonplace, as in, it's suggested to me a lot, to identify the failure to provide culturally appropriate housing. Now, there's good reasons for that kind of diagnosis, including repeated failures to design for local use, the crowding pressures and the thermal design needs. And the inevitable conclusion then is that more and better community consultation is needed to determine culturally appropriate solutions. So far, so good, no arguments. <laughs> but such critiques are often scant on the details of housing hardware requirements, the amenities, the plumbing, the wiring and the networks which confer house function. And they're quiet on how something like good design may generate generate solutions that are so bespoke that they're later hard to maintain. They don't tell us about the processes involved in altering government housing tenders or questions of expertise or labour or logistics. Yet these mundane issues we've found in our research are at the heart of housing design, degradation and restoration. So our work took something of a different approach. What if instead of exacerbating the burden of community consultation endured by remote community residents, or of assuming that front end construction processes matter more than the maintenance that follows, we instead strengthened the standards that housing must meet and the protections that tenants should rightfully expect to live in safe and well tended homes. What kind of work does that take? Thank you. This is something that our incubator has pursued with our partner Health Habitat. By doing such things as supporting the revision of the respected Housing for Health, the guide. Formerly known as the National Indigenous Housing Guide, this resource provides detailed specifications of the materials, the hardware and the installation processes required for sustainable housing in various environmental contexts. And it meets gaps in the mainstream National Construction Code of Australia. Now, we'd note that coordinating and hosting meetings to discuss whether the recommended standards of, of tap fittings and electrical outlets require updating or if enough attention is paid to age and disability design, etc., is a form of engagement lacking immediately clear impact. It is un unexciting, but it's necessary. Strategizing how the guide can again assume significance to policymakers, who in turn can set detailed standards for housing tenders, offers genuine potential to consistently improve resident living conditions. And even though, unlike a journal impact factor, influencing the attention paid to repairs and maintenance is difficult to see or measure, our investment in such activities rests on our founding assumption that appropriate housing is also housing that staves off breakdown through funded and planned repair and maintenance regimes. 
And we've achieved this by assisting Health Habitat's housing for health methodology to become embedded in government refurbishment programs, such as with the Northern Territory's government's new preventative repairs and maintenance scheme. So this invisible work is also work that the incubator has facilitated. And what we're saying is we think it's actually going to improve the lot of households across Australia, but it's not something that we can punch out for a track record or on a CV. Over to Liam. Undertaking research only in the pursuit of university rec recognition is of course not the point. True impacts are the shared achievement of diverse coalitions of courageous tenants, their advocates, sympathetic public servants, activists, industry allies, and motivated researchers. While grant and ethics applications require conventional outcomes promised prior to any investigation, legitimate revelations and an understanding of what to do with them emerge through relational work, where policy is understood as both the problem and a tool to leverage solutions, one of many. Nor has our relational work typically been so technically focused or even directed towards obviously practical ends. The value and privilege of the incubator model that the Henry Halloran Trust has supported has been the capacity to pursue inquiries and collaborations without the demand for immediate impact. This is not to put an argument about knowledge for its own sake, but rather a claim that useful or innovative insights emerge through a variety of exploratory and open-ended endeavours and will often require broad-based support to become actionable. To illustrate, our collaboration with the artist collective Snack Syndicate began and continues as a reading group called Infrastructural Inequalities. It's also produced an experimental online journal exhibiting the writing of mostly early career researchers. Our most, our most public output was a two-day program at Artspace in Woolloomooloo, comprising an exhibition, curated lectures and panels that brought artists and media producers into conversation with academics and the Health Habitat Network. This work is about fostering critical publics, whose members may not be at the coalface of remote r and programs, but whose expertise and social capital can strengthen any strategy for proposed solutions. The point here is that work that might be rendered ancillary to incubator achievements is as important to its impact as a narrow cluster of conventional academic outputs that do officially count, research, publication, citation metrics, grant income, and so on. With the Civic Studio in New Orleans, to take another example, the mixed media project represented um, on the slide examined the work of the New Orleans Sewerage and Water Board to keep that sinking city dry. It directed attendees at the 4S Conference, Science and Technology Studies Conference to the history of New Orleans and its contemporary infrastructural challenges through a field trip to the Carrollton Water Treatment Plant. And it represented the labour of sewage and water board employees in an eight page lift out in New Orleans major daily newspaper, The Advocate. Uh, urban designer Aaron Chang was central to that work. Of course, the excitement of the public event or the beauty of published photography masks the administrative, logistical and social labour of pulling such things into being. But the work of engaging existing reading publics in their homes or building new critical publics in non-university spaces is markedly more impactful than any paywalled journal article. Effective impact and engagement, of course, generates more hidden work ethics applications, research agreements, budgeting, reporting, and so on. And it requires building a public profile to sculpt public discourse through strategic partnerships and work with media professionals. For issues important to the incubator, this has often resembled small scale campaigning, briefing journalists on how to effectively narrate the slow decay of government negligence in ways that are both attuned to complexity and which might interrupt the apathy of low expectations for remote Indigenous service provision. Over to you, Tess. Thanks, Liam. So as university funding available for remote fieldwork has atrophied, and not just because of COVID, the founding of the incubator gave us valuable leveraging capacity. We've since received major grants from the former New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage, the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, and the Australia Research Council. 
effectively multiplying trust fund funds by 2.5 for every dollar. <laughs> Importantly, our wins are also deeply dependent on our faculty research and finance support staff. The simple point we're making is this, no success, no meaningful impact or engagement is achieved without shared efforts. Even when those successes must be revisioned into narratives of individual academic achievement for the purpose of claiming a track record, these are always collective accomplishments and the trust model actually allows for this. For another example, in 2018, the incubator responded to calls to investigate a water contamination incident in Borroloola in the Northern Territory. Some of our fellow researchers on, at the University of Sydney questioned the connection that we were then drawing between housing and water. Because these are distinct policy fields and activist networks that are not typically thought of together, people thought we were being a bit odd. This research in which our colleague Kirsty Howie is also central would in fact lead to all four Northern Territory land councils calling for a safe drinking water act and to the establishment of new ministerial portfolios for indigenous essential services and water security. Now we couldn't have forecast this, but we knew enough to understand that water security is key to safe and healthy housing. And so we persisted with these off-topic interrogations. And many of the steps, despite the watery topic, were time-consuming and dry. The conclusion that there are no minimum protections for safe drinking water in Northern Territory remote communities required sifting through under-analyzed legislation, license agreements, a memorandum of understanding, a customer contract, and numerous arcane reports, which I would say were designed not to be read. Activating the findings is the basis now for public talks and media interview interviews and less visible continuing land council and ministerial briefings, submissions, workshops, even a presentation to the Productivity Commission and behind the scenes strategy talk with diverse allies. Now, it would be misleading to characterise such research as collaborative if this implies some equal input in developing research questions and investigating answers. Where it has concerned regional and remote Indigenous communities, our work has been underpinned by deep, authentic, existing relationships with residents and the expertise of relevant service providers, but the truth is neither group has consistently contributed to what we might claim as outputs. Instead, and I think this is important what we're stressing about the liberation of the incubator model, we've often assumed the role of strategic allies at the request of partners with different skills or time pressures. Now for the artist Miriam Charlie, who you're seeing on your screen, this meant we secured a Northern Territory Arts Grant for her to photograph Borrelula housing. For Civic Studio in New Orleans, whose, whose work you saw earlier, it meant supporting the development of a participatory framework for that collective. And for Health Habitat, it's meant acting as their research advisor and quietly connecting that NGO back into new government programs and otherwise applying our skills as knowledge and policy brokers, including by calling in other experts as needed, sharing the expertise, not being selfish about it. So the work that needs to be done is not always the visible work, noted for collaborations. It means reading unfriendly materials and doing due diligence with grey literatures. Now such work I hope we've shown is not at odds with playful, speculative and collaborative endeavours. Not at all. Instead, we assert, assert that these pursuits mutually benefit one another. Nonetheless, while the work we have done does not match conventional case studies of collaboration, co-development or co-design, it's not been pointless. Instead, it's been necessary to subvert the opacity of governing systems and to effect meaningful change in the process. I'm really proud of what we've done. And while we don't know how someone like Peter Phibbs might phrase all of this for acquitting trust investments, we think it's what makes the incubator program so effective. It puts trust in researchers and it lets them find their way to driving impact. And we thank you for it.
<laughs> Thank you. Next. Well, Tess and Liam, thanks very much. That was a very interesting um, presentation. And oh my God, have you guys been on a journey for, for three years? And, and you, you know, as, as um, someone was there at the start of your process, I am so proud of what you guys have done. Yeah. You, <laughs> you've really, you've really um, provided, I think, um, what the trust is all about. We're a very unconventional yeah. research funding body. We actually aren't, aren't incredibly interested in all the small print and the footnotes and, you know, the method you're going to use on day 173 of your research mm -hmm. project. We want to know that it's an important project that, that is going to um, do some good. Yeah. And we also just want to make sure that we've got some researchers who know what, we do, know what they're doing. And then we're really happy to give them some trust to find their way through, through um, that maze. And um, some of the things that, that your incubator got involved with um, maybe wasn't you know, at the top of our mind at the start of the process. But looking particularly around that work around drinking water and the NT and, and um, uh, the respect I think you've gained amongst the land councils and um, other parts of the community in Northern Territory as a very effective agent of change mm. that, that's knowledge based, but also um, demonstrate a lot of policy skills is, is really a fantastic outcome for the yeah. trust and yeah. we thank you for it. So um, let's, um, let's interrupt our, our um, love fest here on the, the stage <laughs> of the Festival of Urbanism and just see if we've got any um, questions um, coming in from the audience. Now, um, the, the question I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, um, Tess, is um, uh, while we're giving people a chance to pound away on the chat, is what advice would you give to our new incubator? Okay, there, there's a bit of overlap there. You have both ended up doing um, infrastructure. Uh, any, anything that you know after the end of your, your sort of incubator journey that, that might be useful to Joanne and Crystal this evening? Uh, I, one of the things that I was really stressing here is that for community impact, researchers are in this unique position of actually having the time, the paid time, to do the work that community groups can't do, or that's that um, either because it is time consuming or because this stuff is difficult to digest. And I think the world of planning and infrastructure um, in particular lends itself to academic deep dives. And those deep dives are necessary because to be frank, um, a lot of infrastructural legacies are also stories of corruption. Um, they're stories where um, capital has been sunk in different ways um, and seems to prefigure what's possible for different community futures. And, un and unpeeling that, unfurling that and exposing that for what it is, rather than constantly suggesting it's all de novo, open to change, open to possibility. I think it's really, that's the benefit and to put that much more simply, if academics could see community engagement as also, this is the point of our talk, as also stuff you do at the desk, then I think that's the gift that we can bring back. Um, so yes, privilege those consultations. Yes, privilege the public events. You must get that public profile early. Um, don't neglect it, but don't um, also, second guess the importance of doing what academics are skilled at doing, which is deconstructing um, arcane literatures and understanding what's going on and then representing that to publics in a simple form so that everyone can understand what's going on and have a debate about it. Yeah. No, no, thanks for that, Tess. Um, we've got a, um, a question there from um, Nicole, which is um, now that um, <laughs> the Housing Health Incubator, I think has been thoroughly incubated, um, where to next? What, what, what's your um, life past the, um, the trust incubator look like, Jess? Uh, well, as mentioned, we have a um, Australia Research Council Special Research Initiative grant. Um, we're really, again, thank you, Incubator um, and the Halloran Trust, because we were able to leverage the work we've done um, and be one of 7% of applicants in this, in this scheme to actually get a grant. And that grant is looking more deeply at this issue of legacy infrastructures and how they um, do or don't enable different community futures. 
So it is a question that's got a future orientation, but, but by looking at what are the swag of things that are um, that pre-ordain some of what what's dragging people or holding them in place right now. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an extension of what we've done in this work, which is not only to continually talk about repair and maintenance, um, which has been key to the Housing for Health approach. It takes that into a, a different step, which is to say, how did, what are people dealing with? Um, and who's responsible for it? That's the second question. Um, because abandonment, I think, is the next part of um, how do you force communities to um, go into modes of retreat, unplanned retreat, if you like, through forms of just neglect or uh, you've, you've got legacy infrastructure in place, nobody's taking responsibility for it, there's lead in the water as a result, therefore that community won't actually get new housing in the future. Like all of these things kind of come, in, come together. So that's what the work that we're doing in the future. Excellent, excellent. Okay, well, all the best with that. Um, but look, um, this is almost a related question um, uh, from, um, I think, one of your colleagues, Tessa, Elspeth Proben, um, who really appreciated your presentation and your work. But the, the term trust comes up a lot. Have you got any ideas of how we can get that into our government and uni-based uni funding schemes? Well, I would like our government and uni-based funding schemes to learn from the Henry Heller and Trust because we've just, not to return to that love fest, or maybe to return to the love fest, but what I am trying to underline and emphasise, it's been unique. I used to run a research centre on soft money. I had 50 staff. Like, I know the game um, of trying to pull that stuff into place. And it's been absolutely unique to be given the startup impetus and um, enabling capacity and then just trusted so the word trust yes trusted to get on with it um, without being burdened by this necessity to come up with a swag load of unachievable kpis just to get the, the money in the first place and i th i mean there was a little um tw tweet going around a little while ago that um and i don't i think it might actually be modelled on something that a European country is actually thinking of doing, which is you load up the researchers with the money that they need to begin with and let them do it. Mm. <laughs> you don't make, then after that, they can start competing for funds. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that's an idea I'm sure <laughs> the academics in the audience would be uh, getting right across their test. But um, just, uh, we've just got one la last question we've got time for, which is um, coming about, and uh, this might be a, uh, you know, a question for um, both of you about how do you, how do you manage the project in a way so it doesn't get too big? You, you know what I mean? Like there's lots of worthy things, I guess, you could be doing in the housing for health space. At any point, you sort of feel a bit overwhelmed, Tess, and um, you thought you might be um, biting off more than you could chew in your in, in your incubator? Every single day. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start, I can see Liam gr grinning and nodding. So Liam, <laughs> do you want to take that one? Um apart from overwork, I think, look, I think, I mean, really practically insofar as our project extended from thinking about housing to thinking about the intersecting infrastructures on which safe housing depends, I think we have sort of cordoned off our focus to attend to debates and histories around water infrastructure and have done much less on other things that we might have been reading, energy infrastructures, waste infrastructures that are equally important and we've probably dabbled in. Um, I think it has become bigger or certainly different to the original you know, application that I wasn't a part of and that Tess wrote up. Um, certainly there has been more emphasis on uh, work in the US context, but I think that you know, one of the benefits of the incubator contra many other grants that have much shorter timeframes is that you're able to do that comparative work that pays dividends that aren't immediately evident. So, you know, when you're talking about Indigenous housing or anything in remote communities, one of the key lessons that Health Habitat has shown all through their work for the last three decades has been the reason houses fall apart is not about tenants, it's about insufficient repair and maintenance. And in a similar way, debates around um, 
remote communities and the failures of infrastructures often get framed as, you know, the challenge of remoteness rather than all these other factors that contribute to failure, which are about particular populations being served, which are about tenders, which are about logistics, and looking at other contexts that aren't remote in the same way and finding how those things are similar and different, as well as like what are effective intervention strategies and tactics has been really useful. So I think you sort of have to let it get too big and then pull back in and you just jettison some stuff that you started and will never get to finish and hopefully you get another grant and, you know, keep your career ticking along. That's the, you know. <laughs> yeah. Very important to keep your career ticking along, Liam. But, uh, <laughs> um, look, uh, look, that's all we've got time for in the um, incubator studio. But um, can we put our virtual hands together for Tess and Liam? That was a really interesting um, presentation. And um, I'm, I'm really excited as um, someone that sat in the room with Tess, uh, what must be three years ago now, Tess, mm -hmm. where, we, where um, you presented on this project. And wow, have you, has it come a long way in three years? And I'm sure um, my, my colleagues in the trust will be just as excited about what you've been up to. Anyway, that's all we've got time for at Incubator Night. Can I just give a shout out to the future events of the trust? We've got um, an excellent panel on Wednesday evening. And on Thursday, we've got the uh, eighth annual Henry Halloran uh, lecture, where we're hear hearing from Ian Malhern, um, looking at the exciting I I issue of housing policy. I hope you can join us then. Everyone have a very good evening. This is Over and Out from Downtown Festival Urbanism.